Hello folks. Well, I just got a couple of magazines recently. Um, I subscribe to uh, Science News and um, it's a bi-weekly magazine. This is uh, October 24th of this year and there was an article about quantum mechanics and uh, entanglement and they always use the word weird or spooky whenever they talk about this. And then in uh, Scientific American, which also just came in, uh, this is uh, November 2009 uh, issue, and uh, <clears throat> this is about, uh, let's see, on page 25, and it also talks about quantum uh, entanglement over here. And um, by the way, on the um, Science News, um, the article I was talking about was on page 12. Anyway, I started thinking, wow, these are pretty uh, interesting articles. I've been following uh, QM for a while, and uh, so I thought I would chat about it in a relatively unstructured way. Um, but it is pretty cool stuff. Um, here's what's been happening. They've been trying to build quantum computers, and you might say, well, well why, uh, why would we want to build these quantum computers? Well, one of the major applications for building a quantum computer is to figure out quantum mechanics because it would operate by the same principles it was trying to compute. Now, what's different about quantum computers and regular computers is regular computers do one thing at a time or several things at a time, parallel processing, but not too many. But what a quantum computer does, it does everything at once. And you might think, that's impossible, but no! It's quantum weirdness. It can actually do that. Now, here's the problem. In quantum mechanics, in order to predict the probability of something occurring, you need to not only look at that particular thing, but everything else that can happen. And that's a whole lot of stuff. Now, if you use a regular computer to do this, it'll take forever. You have to make certain assumptions. But with a quantum computer, it can do it at once. So it can actually make the calculation. And that's a pretty fascinating thing. Now, just as an aside, because this has always fascinated me, I've never seen anybody talk about this before, but um, I do a lot of tutoring, and I really like uh, organic chemistry. And they have these things called resonance structures, and they're make-believe structures that represent molecules. Now, the reason they created these resonance structures, and this is not the part they don't talk about, it's the connection between resonance structures and Feynman diagrams. That's where I'm getting, okay, when I get there. But these resonant structures, what you do is you create a whole bunch of them. What they do is they represent all possibilities of where the electrons could be. And they treat the electrons as objects. But when you put them all together and you look at which are more likely to occur, which are more stable or more likely, you put them all together, you get a picture of the molecule. Because when a molecule is not being observed or, or reacting sort of, that's not exactly true, so I'll take that back because it's a little complex there. But when a molecule is not being observed, its electrons are existing as waves, wave functions, waves of probability. And all these little structures that we draw are, are ways for us to kind of get a handle on where the electrons are. But, but resonant structures are just amazingly not quantitative. There are, there are by the way, uh, ways of doing the calculations, but we... Uh, can never solve them, because we don't have quantum computers. So essentially, it's a very crude method, but it works brilliantly. It's a really great method, but extremely crude. Now, on the other hand, Feynman diagrams were created by Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate, and bongo player! Boom, boom, boom. That was unnecessary. But they are extremely quantitative, and what he did was he created these diagrams that show how particles interact and they're reversible in time. That's really cool. Uh, but the thing about it is, is that by creating these diagrams, and just like resonance forms, all the possible things that can happen, you can actually figure out the probability of one thing happening. Remember, the probability of one thing happening depends on the probabilities of everything happening. So you can't know one thing for sure until you know everything, and if you have a regular computer, you'll never know. Not precisely, but with a quantum computer, you can. Now, 
besides figuring out about quantum mechanics, you can use a quantum computer to decrypt messages. If you have the actual message there, a quantum computer can work all solutions at once, where a conventional computer cannot. It takes time, and so if the time it will take to solve the message is longer than we expect the universe to be around before heat death or whatever other kind of death, well, certainly before five billion years when the Earth is going to be engulfed by the sun when it becomes a red giant, well, then it's a pretty good code. But the cool thing about quantum computers is, is that even though they can conceivably crack any code, using quantum mechanics, we've already figured out how to make an unbreakable code. What? That's impossible. It's a contradiction. No, it's not really. Essentially, we can make uh, it impossible to obtain the code. You can have completely secure communications over the Internet using quantum circuits. And they're working on this crap already. And the idea would be is that when anybody tries to access that information, it will corrupt the information. So only the person that that information is to, to go to will have access to it. And they will be notified that someone's tried to do that. In fact, Google is, uh, well, Google has been informed of this by the individuals that are doing the work on it. And Google said, gee, that's exactly what we, uh, we don't want. We want all the information we can get about everybody. This quantum thing where we can protect ourselves from people snooping, we better research that because we don't want that. And we either are going to have to find a way around it, which they probably cannot, or find a way to adopt that into their model or find out something about it. But it's kind of cool. they got lots of money to throw out there. Okay, we're rambling on. Um, a lot of folks think that quantum mechanics and stuff is uh, a function of the very, very small. Well, it turns out that this is not true. We're already building macroscopic quantum devices. Now, they don't need to be huge, but they're visible to the naked eye. And this has been going on for some time. And every single time they do this, they go, wow, you know, we're on the way to quantum computer. But we got this problem or that problem. And within six months to a year, whatever problem they're, they're mentioning is being solved. And this has been going on now for several years. So most people think um, that we will, the people that are knowledgeable about it, uh, that we will have quantum computers um, at some time in the future, and it probably uh, won't be very long, um, possibly uh, within 10 years or 15 years. But uh, with things like that, it could be sooner because we're really making some cool progress. Now, just to confuse you some more about this uh, stuff, um, when you have a, a quantum system, what happens is is that particles are going to be entangled when they encounter each other. Their wave functions interact with each other. They can then be separated, go to opposite ends of the universe, and then when you do something to one particle, instantaneously, ignoring space and time, that other particle will be affected. And with larger systems, this is happening all the time. It's happening to all of us. But the thing is, is that there are so many of these quantum events occurring that they're all occurring, but they're all creating a lot of noise. So it becomes very, very complex. So it's not like we're living in a classical world. We're living in a quantum world. It just appears to be classical because of all the noise, but we're finding ways to um, retain uh, this allegiance between particles to do quantum computing. And there's some really, really uh, clever ways to do this. But I'll just mention one. They've got several. Um, and all of these seem to, to be very viable possibilities. But uh, if you have an individual particle, you might have some problems. Uh, they call it decoherence. Uh, it's bombarded by another particle, and it loses this entanglement. Uh, but you can create many particles that are all entangled with each other, and you cr they exist in an equilibrium state a stable state. And there are many possible configurations that will maintain that essentially low energy state. So when particles from the environment affect some of the particles in this equilibrium state, what happens is, is that it automatically error corrects. In other words, if you have many po uh, particles that are all entangled, they can cancel 
out the effects of the environment to a degree. Um, there is a limit uh, at, at, at a certain point when you can do that, but they're working on that. And some other really cool systems which you can read about in these uh, articles. So, whew, that's it. Oh, I got a lot more, but that's it. Take care.